So, composite materials is a new subject. Um, so I'm going to introduce composite materials and um, try to show you how you can do uh, some analysis uh, with composite materials to build, okay, how, how to do the lamina analysis, which is, you know, composites you have the plies, so maybe I can try to, to draw here. So you have the plies. Each ply will have fibers in some specific orientation. For example, this ply here has fibers in this direction. So these fibers can be carbon fibers, glass fibers, um, Kevlar, which is very, very, very strong material, okay? Uh, and lightweight, so strong and very lightweight. So these fibers, they are held together in a matrix of uh, a polymer. Uh, can be, yeah, usually is a, is a, a polymer, can be polyester, uh, epoxy, these kind of materials. So this material, they are not very strong, this matrix that holds the fibers together, but their role in the, in, in the ply is to, to keep the fibers in place and transmit the load, okay? So when you apply a load, imagine this is a plate, okay? When you apply a load, the, the, this resin transfers the load to the fibers. Uh, one very important thing is that, for example, for this ply here, if I apply a load in this in the direction of the fibers, for example, if I apply a force, very well, it behaves very well. But if I apply a load in the transverse direction to the fibers, this will be a very weak response, right? So. Very strong in the direction of the, the fiber, if I apply a load in the direction of the fiber. Very weak in the transverse direction. Yes? You mean by strong that it takes more of the load? Yeah. For the same weight, okay, I always associate weight because I, steel is also very strong, but you don't see steel in aircraft structures, do you? It's strong, but it's very heavy. So the advantage of composite materials is that they are very strong and very lightweight. That's why they are increasingly used in aerospace industry, okay? There is only this caveat here. In the transverse direction, it is weak. In this direction, it is weak. So we need to, that's why there's a lot of tailoring or design of composites because we need to understand the loading direction in our structure so that we can uh, design our laminate. We call it, laminate is the layup of different plies, okay? We can design the laminate, the number of plies, the direction of the fibers in each ply so that it is able to carry the load with the minimum weight, okay? So basically, I can try, maybe I can use this figure and be built on top of this. Okay, I have the situation I can only apply in, if I apply in this direction, okay, it's fine. But imagine I want to apply a load now You want to apply a load in, in this direction, for example. Something like this. OK? 
okay? So we can think something like this. If I apply a load, a load in this direction, I can decompose this force into components, right? One in the fiber direction and one in the, the transverse direction, let's say. Fx, or imagine this is my x-axis, the fiber direction. And F, Fy, transverse to the fibers. So this ply here will carry very well my Fx component of my force, no problem, but it will fail with Fy. So what can I do? Well, what can I do is I can add another ply in top of this one. So I, I can do something like this. Let's see if I can. I can add a ply in top of this one, which have now the fibers in this direction. OK? So the ply on the bottom carries the Fx. The ply on the top carries the Fy. And all should be good. It's just a very quick example, OK? It's, it's not as simple as that. But anyway, just a quick example to see how we can design our material to carry some specific load with composite materials, yeah? Uh, so we are going to see how to build this. We call this laminate, while the previous one we call this apply only. <coughs> apply as the fibers in one direction only. A laminate can have n plies. And each ply can have some specific direction. And these plies, they have a thickness. Okay. The plies, they have a, a, a thickness. So when you build a ply with uh, a laminate with n plies, so if you build a laminate, for example, with five, <coughs> five plies, if you lay them up five plies with uh, 0 0.5 thickness, you have at the end, the laminate with 2.5 millimeters thickness, for example, right? Of course, the more plies you add, more weight you are adding. So it is your role as an engineer designer to define how many plies you need. Uh, if you can optimize, so there's a lot of optimization here. If you can reduce, for example, the number of plies by finding the ideal orientation of the fibers in your laminate of the different plies, a lot of things can be done. Another thing I would like to say is, in Abacus, we are going to see how to model this in Abacus as well. So you can, in the FEA, well, we are not going to see this today, but we will see during the term, don't worry, how to build your laminate in Abacus, how to define the orientation of each ply of the fibers, and how to model a structure in Abacus, right? So this is another thing I will ask you to do in the coursework. Okay, to build the laminate, to carry some load, do the analytical calculations we are going to do here, and then go to Abacus, do the FEA simulation, compare the results, write the report. Something like that. Okay, so let's start from the beginning in our analysis. So any questions on this uh, very quick presentation of uh, composites? Oh, there's one more thing I can say. There are, for example, glass fiber, they have, for example, they have the laminate like this, and they have uh, small fibers randomly oriented. You, we can have something like this. Uh, this is a quasi-isotropic behavior. So this behavior we, we see here, very good in one direction, but in other direction, weak, or if you want. Uh, different properties in different directions. This is an autotropic behavior. It's a strange name, but if you have the same behavior in for, for example, if I load in this direction or this direction, if I get the same behavior, this is known as isotropic. Okay, iso is the same. Uh, there are also other Solutions is called the prep prec. I think it's like this prep prec, 
which it comes, the laminate comes already built with a predefined number of plies. And you can have, for example, something like this uh, in the fibers in this direction and fibers in this direction. You can clearly see. So these preprex, they, they come, um, the resin comes in the um, uh, a viscous form, so you have to store this in a kind of a fridge or a freezer. And then, when you take this preprex, you, you need to have a mold, okay, to get your, your, your shape. And then you need to apply some temperature and pressure to promote the curing of the resin. It's like a glue. Think like a glue, all right? You have the glue, and then you wait a bit for the glue to dry and make the bonding, right? Here is the same. You can also, if you decide not to apply temperature and pressure, you can also cure the resin that way, but it will take longer and might not be such a strong bonding process. So, yeah, there's a lot of, if you search a bit on Google, there's a lot, a lot of these kind of solutions. So just for you to be aware a little bit on the, if you want to. Well, if, if, if you go to, now the lab is closed because of the rack thing. But you know, the, the former student car, um, they, they, they use this a lot there. They have an, a, an oven there to where, basically what they do is they 3D print the mold then they lay up the, this preprex on the mold. Then they put the entire package inside a, a bag, it's a vacuum bag. So they then, with a pump, they remove the air, they put vacuum there so that the preprex gets the form of the mold, right? And then they put the entire thing in the oven to, to do the curing of the resin and get the... So if you, when they open the labs again, if you want to go there, you can go there, and uh, if they are manufacturing something, you can see it's, it's, it's quite interesting to see that, right? We also do, well, for aerospace, we, I don't know if you're aware of this UAS challenge scheme we are running, so every year we run an aircraft, um, so, this year we are not running because of the rack in the building. We don't have a chance to manufacture, so we cannot compete. But if you want to join next year, it should be fine. But the manufacturing we have been using is more balsa wood and plywood to get the ribs. And we, we buy a carbon fiber, it's a composite material. We buy carbon fiber rods for the spars, tubes, all right? So they, they are like a beam with a hollow circular cross-section. So they are made of uh, carbon fiber uh, reinforced polymer, CFRP. Okay. So it's a tube, which is, you can see the fibers. So it's a tube like this. And the fibers are, so you have the fibers distributed. <laughs> They are distributed in several directions. So this is all a tube. So basically this is for the spars and then, and then you have the ribs made of balsa wood. Uh, you, you might have another smaller diameter tube here, car <coughs> carbon fiber tube here with the fibers. And then we use uh, some plastic wrapping to get, so we use this kind of very prehistoric construction, but the UAS thing, you have a limit of 10 kilograms with payload included. The less payload you carry, less points you have in the competition. So there's a lot of optimization, reduced weight, and managing to carry the loads. Anyway, if you are interested, I, I, I can talk about this. So I'm deviating a bit of the subject. So let's start our analysis by looking at one ply. Let's consider one ply like this. Uh, 
the fibers oriented in the horizontal direction for simplicity. Okay. So let's say this is going to be, okay, we need a coordinate system. So this is going to be my x direction in the direction of the fibers. This is my y direction perpendicular to the fibers. Uh, and then, okay, we are going to apply some loading in the plane direction. So we are going to apply a loading something like this. Okay. Sigma XX. So, by the way, now here in composites, you will need to, we are going to do a lot of stress strain transformations. It's something you did learn last year in solid body mechanics. Right? So, uh, you will have a sigma xx, which is going to be a load different from zero. Uh, and uh, we are going to have sigma y, y equal to sigma z, z equal to tau z, x equal to tau z, y equal to zero. Right? So this three here is from plane stress assumption. Okay, thin uh, okay, maybe I can okay, thin plate, right? So when you have a, a structure like this, like a, a sheet of paper, x and y dimensions are much larger than the thickness, we can say we are in plane stress conditions, right? Yes? Uh, not beam theory. Sorry? Some... No, no, it's not a beam, it's a, it's, a, it's a plate. It's like, okay, imagine like a, this sheet of paper, okay? It's, this is a plane. Uh, sigma x is the loading we are applying in the fiber direction. Uh, sigma yy is equal to zero. We don't have a load in the y direction. Okay. Now, from the Hooke's law, from the Hooke's law, you have the strain in the x direction is one over e times the stress in the x direction minus the Poisson ratio uh, times sigma yy plus sigma zz. But this is equal to zero, this is equal to zero. Okay, so this becomes equal then to sigma xx over Oh, by the way, in terms of young models, now we need to make a distinction because we are going to have a young models in the x direction, which is going to be different from the young models in the y direction. Well, for obvious reasons, right? Like I said, if, if I load in this transverse direction of the fibers is very weak. It also means, of course, the young models in this direction is going to be uh, weaker than the young models in the x direction. So they will not be equal. So we need to be careful in Duke's law because of this, right? So we also need to be careful with uh, the Poisson ratio. 
We need to have, because what is going to happen is the Poisson ratio, xy, is going to be different from yx in apply. Okay, you know, okay, so let me see if I can, let me see if I can give you an example. I want to keep this figure, so let me copy to a new slide. So if I have an isotropic material, let's imagine a square, all right? This doesn't look very much like a square. If I have a square like this, and if I stretch, so this is my x direction is the same as the horizontal direction. If I stretch my square in the x direction, <coughs> I'm going, I'm exaggerating here, of course. I'm going to add this. It will increase the width and it will reduce the height, right? So this height, this height here was reduced to this height here, right? Okay, let's say height one, height zero, so height zero is bigger than height one, but for the width, so if this is my, width zero, in, if this is my width one, for the width, situation is width of zero is lower than width one. So the reason why, when I stretch in the horizontal direction, uh, there is this reduction in the height of my square is because of the Poisson ratio, right? So in an isotropic material, if I do this same operation, by stretching now, I'm going to use a green color, stretching now in the y direction, I get the same amount of reduction in the width direction. Because the material is isotropic, so the material properties are the same for all directions. So for the green, we are talking about the Poisson ratio, uh, y x for the red i'm talking about the poisson ratio x y and for isotropic material these two are equal and we usually call it just poisson ratio right now for the composite material for the ply that is completely so if i just for you to understand, if I apply a stretch in the horizontal direction, uh, I might get something like this. I'm going to eventually exaggerate. But if I apply now on the vertical direction, I might get something like this. Completely different, right? So <coughs> this is going to be my Poisson ratio yx. This is going to be due to my Poisson ratio xy, and these are going to be different in apply, right? Okay. Uh, Maybe there's a better way to explain this, but that's one that came to my head, so if I find a better one, I will update you. But the key thing is, uh, yeah, we need to be 
careful with, with this. Okay, so we can continue from here. Now, if I write the deformation in the y direction, this is going to be equal to 1 over EY, is the young models in the y direction, times sigma YY minus Poisson ratio YX, sigma XX plus sigma ZZ. Okay? So sigma YY is equal to 0, sigma ZZ equal to 0. So this is going to be equal to minus Poisson ratio y x over e y times sigma x x. Okay. Now. Uh, There's, there was another thing I could have said I could have said here which is definition of the Poisson ratio for example gamma xy is going to be equal to minus the de deformation in the y direction over the deformation in the x direction and it's quite easy to understand because look at this for this case in red for the figure in the top, my xx is positive, while my epsilon yy is negative, right? So I come from a higher length or height to a lower height. So my epsilon yy is going to be negative. So when I do the ratio of these two, if I don't have a minus there, my Poisson ratio will become negative. So I need to have the minus there. And this is the definition of Poisson ratio. That's the amount of strain we get in the perpendicular direction over the strain you apply in the, in this case, in the horizontal direction, okay? Right, so uh, if I do that, if I do that here, what I just wrote there, okay, yeah. Now I have this, the strains here, so if I replace, so minus y, y is going to be So noisy, these guys, right? And epsilon x x is going to be equal to oh, this x is missing here. Uh, it's going to be equal to sigma x x times e x. So look at that. This cancels with this, so we get at the end Poisson ratio xy times the young models in the y direction is going to be equal to the Poisson ratio yx times the young models in the x direction. Very important result. So this tells us, you can see from this equation, well, this is quite interesting because if the material is isotropic, what is going to happen? If the material is isotropic, the young models EY and EX, they will be equal, so they cancel out and automatically the two Poisson ratios, they were going to be also equal from this equation, right? But in apply, EX and EY, they are different. So automatically from this equation, you can see the Poisson ratios are also going to be very different. Very different. They're going to be different. All right, so taking this into account, we can write 
the strains uh, the shear strain as well Okay, so if you just replace that back in the previous Hooke's law that we wrote, you can then write the relation between strains and stresses. Basically, this is the Hooke's law for, for apply, right? So this will multiply sigma xx, sigma yy, in general, and tau xy. Okay? So if they are zero, if sigma y is zero, yeah, you put here zero. But that does not mean, so, if a sigma, for example, if you look at this equation, if, like we considered before, if sigma y y is zero, uh, that does not mean that the, the, the strain in the y direction is going to be zero, right? Because you have the Poisson ratio there. Okay? So if you have a, a stress in the x direction, when multiplied by this term, you will get a component in the y direction. So this, this, we can write this in a more for, uh, compact form that you see in books. This is known as the S matrix or the compliance matrix. Okay, which basically is a matrix that relates the stresses with strains and vice versa because you can say okay I can say I if I know the strains if I want to get the stresses the only thing I have to do is just to invert this matrix invert this matrix and then I can get my stresses from my strains. Right? Does it make sense or not? can skip this bit here because right now what we're going to do now is we are going to let me copy yeah I can copy this guy we are going to consider a more generic situation, which we are going to need, which is a situation like this. <coughs> no, it's not. This is not the best way. The best way is to, to do like this. So you have our plate, but now our fibers are going to be aligned like this. Okay? 
and we will have our loading applied in the horizontal direction. So if this is X capital, uh, well, let me do X prime. No, let me do, no, let me do X and Y. So you will have here a sigma XX, like we had before, in the horizontal direction. But now we will have a new coordinate system which is oriented with the fibers. So we'll have a coordinate system, this one, So this is going to be x prime and this y prime, okay? Why do we need to do this? Because, for example, if you buy these plies from a manufacturer, they will give you these properties that you have here, you know, young models in the y direction, young models in the x direction, the Poisson ratio, you, it will give you these properties because you must do the mechanical testing and give you these properties. But these properties, they are in the direction of the fibers and in the perpendicular direction to the fibers, right? So we need then to be able to find a relation because we are not going to have loading always in the direction of the fibers, right? In our structure. Think on an aircraft or wing. You can have loading in many different directions. You have loading because of drive because of lift, because of whatever, gusts. And so you, you, you have loads in different, many different directions, so we need to be able to manage this more generic situation where we have a load applied and our fibers have an uh, orientation which we can define by this angle. This is the fiber direction. Let's say this is my angle theta. Okay? And then, let's see if you remember, what I need to do is basically stress transformation from the coordinate system in red to the coordinate system in green and vice versa. And for that, you can use the <coughs> plane stress <coughs> transformations. You guys need the more circle? In here too or not? So let me test the waters. So if I give you if I give you something like this, let's let's if I give you something like this, sigma x x equal to let's say five hundred. Sigma y y equal to 100. Tau x y equal to, let me see, uh, 50. No, 200. Let's say megapascal. So how do you plot the, the, the Mohr circle here? What do we have in the horizontal axis? Let's start with the horizontal axis. What do we plot here? Is the direct stresses or the shear stresses? Direct. direct. Very good. Now in the vertical axis? Shear. shear. Great. So let's do something like this. So this is going to be 100, 200, 300, 400, 500. So, 100, 200. All right. Look, I'm, I'm just doing a, a quick revision of stress transformation for plane stress because it's quite important for composites. It's better to invest some time here because I know when you go home, you are not going to invest too much, isn't it? So let's do like this. So first of all, what we have to do is what I recommend. So there are different ways of doing these things. 
But the way I did learn and the way I like most is to do like this. When I get a stress like this, a stress tensor like this, for plain stress, what I usually do is I have the positive convention for stress. So if this is my x direction, if this is my y direction, the positive stresses are, this is the positive sigma x. This is the positive sigma y. And now the, shear, the positive shear stresses are this. This is tau x y. OK? So why do we need this? In this case, the input, they are all positive stresses, plus 500, plus 100, plus 200, right? But if I give you, for example, here, minus 500, if you want to represent it here, so what, what you will have to do is you will have to, OK, sigma x, x is negative, so I need to represent like this, right? Opposite. In this, instead of stretching, it's going to be com in compression. And then I put the 500 here. But the orientation of the arrow tells me it's in compression. Negative is compression, isn't it? That is one thing. If instead of uh, sigma x, if I, for example, give you the, the shear stress negative, what you'll have to do is all the shear stresses you have here, you need to reverse their orientation. So they will all, so this will be like this, like this, like this, and then like this. And then you put here the 200. This is important then for the Mohr circle. So in our case, they're all positive. So the only thing I'm, I, I do is I just replace here by the values. So I get 500 here, uh, 100 for sigma yy, and 200 for shear stress. And then what I do is I start with one plane perpendicular. So we have two basically two shear planes. This one perpendicular to x in green. This one perpendicular to y in blue. OK? Let's start with the, the green perpendicular. So what do I have? Which stress components do I have in that green stress? Well, I have a sigma xx of 500 and a shear stress of 200. That if I put myself here at the center of this square, that shear stress will tend to rotate this square anticlockwise, right? So that's a convention here to represent in the Mohr circle. Anticlockwise. I usually tend to mix up this bit now. Anticlockwise, we represent in the bottom part of the shear stresses, I think. OK, so 100, 200. So 200, so let me draw in green. 200 is the shear stress. 500 is the sigma xx. So this point, I will call it x. Why? Because it represents a a shear plane that is perpendicular to my x coordinate. That's why I put x in the Mohr circle. And then what do I need? Well, I need to go now to the other shear plane, the one in blue. This one in blue here, which stress components do I have there? Well, I have sigma y of 100. And the shear stress, this one, which, if I do the same thing, if I put myself in the center of that square, that shear stress in blue will tend to rotate clockwise. So it goes in the positive tau axis. So in blue, 200. The direct stress is 100. This, I will call this my point Y. OK? And then. I have these two points, x and y. I just connect them with a line. The iPad doesn't like this.
I connect them with a line. Oh, I did this so well that this is going to be the center of my circle, more circle. The intersection of this line with the horizontal axis gives me the center. This and this, this is going to be the radius of my more circle. So the only thing I have to do now is draw a circle with a center at point C. OK? This is my more circle. And you might be thinking, OK, why are we doing all of this? Because this more circle has everything we need for stress transformation. Look at this. Which point is this in the more circle? Maximum. Maximum what? Stress. Which stress? Dark stress. Does this point has any shear stress? So first, first of all, any point in the circle represents one shear plane, right? In this shear plane, they will have two components of stress, a dark stress and a shear stress. That's what you have here in this plot. You have horizontal axis, gives you the dark stress. You have the vertical axis, gives you the shear stress, OK? So this point here in particular, it has a direct stress, but the shear stress is equal to zero. Which plane is this? Principal. Principal, very good. The plane, the shear plane where you have only a direct stress, where the shear stress is zero, is a principal plane. Have you heard about principal stresses, principal planes, and principal directions? Yeah. Well, you get all of this in the Mohr circle. You have principal direction number one is this point. This is the other point here is principal direction number two. Another advantage of the Mohr circle. If you do this with a scale, everything with a scale, and then you just come to the circle and measure things, and you get everything you need. For example, I want to know what is the, for this shear plane here, which makes this angle with my direction x, the angles in the Mohr circle are always two times the real angle. So let's call this is my point, uh, my shear plane A. What is the direct stress in this shear plane? Well, quite easy. You just go to the horizontal axis. You measure this distance with a ruler. You apply the scale factor. You get stress immediately. You don't need to do any calculations. What about shear stress? What is the shear stress in this, in this shear plane? Well, horizontal, vertical axis, you measure this in the vertical axis, you get your shear stress. As simple as that. Now, I want to know, what is my principal direction number one? Look how easy this is going to be. First of all, before we go to principal direction number one, let's do this very quick analysis. How can I calculate the center of my circle? Well, the center is the midpoint between x and y, between 100 and 500. So the midpoint is 100 plus 500 over 2. 600 over 2 is 300. OK? Looks like this is 300 here. What about the radius? Well, what, what can we do for the radius? Look at this, how, how easy this is. The radius of my Mohr circle. I have here a right triangle. I'm going to draw it in black. This is 200. This is 200. So I can say the radius, which is this, the hypotenuse, is going to be the square root of 200 square plus 200 square 
How much is this? Can you give me a number for this, please? Two hundred and eighty-two. Yes, sir. Uh, now look at this. I want to know now my principal stress sigma one. Sigma one. Starting from the origin of this sigma tau axis, how do I get into point one? Look at this. This distance is my c, which is three hundred. And then this distance from here to here is equal to the radius of the circle, isn't it? So if I add the radius, if I add C plus R, I get my principal stress, sigma 1, which is going to be C is 300, radius is 282, my principal stress is 582 megapascal. And it, we can go on here. So basically, the big advantage of, in my view, of the Mohr circle for stress analysis is we can convert a stress transformation or a stress analysis problem into a purely geometric problem. You get everything from trigonometry, basically. You want to see another thing? What is my principal direction? Well, principal direction is this angle. I will call this angle 2 theta 1. Give, will, will give me the principal direction. Number 1 is the angle. This theta 1 is the angle that, so I can put here, if, if I have x, this is my principal direction 1. This is going to be my theta 1 angle, right? In the Mohr circle, we always represent two times the angle. So I, I, how can I get? Look, from trigonometry again, I have a right triangle here. Tangent of 2 theta 1 is equal, this is 200, to 200, over this one here is 500 uh, minus 300 is 200 as well. So is equal to 1. So it means 2 theta 1 is equal to 45 degrees, isn't it? Tangent of 45 is equal to 1, isn't it? So theta 1 is equal to 22.5 degrees. So this angle here is 22.5 degrees. I got the principal direction just from a tangent of an angle. And I keep I can keep going and going and going here, all right? So Okay, so what I'm going to do here is just very quickly more circle again. Imagine we have a, a more circle here. This is the center. This is tau xy. This is sigma xx. OK? So this is point x, this is point y, this is going to be sigma y, y. So my center is going to be, in a very generic term, is the midpoint, so it's sigma x, x plus sigma y, y over 2. My radius is going to be 
square root of so we have this right triangle here so we are going to have sigma xx minus the center which is sigma xx plus sigma yy over 2 square plus tau xy square okay so this will give me something like sigma <coughs> xx minus sigma yy over 2 square plus tau xy square the radius okay I promise the computer lab is going to be much more fun. But I just want to, to leave this here. Okay. Uh, so now, if I want, for example, um, Okay, let me use a different color. If I want, for example, to know no. if I want to know the direct stress for a, a different orientation. I get this equation here, which you are going to recognize. So this bit is the center of this more circle. Now I have sigma xx minus sigma yy over two. Uh, times cosine to theta plus tau xy sine of two theta. Okay. Uh, so this comes from this geometric. So if I am looking for this sigma here. My angle theta is this one here. This is going to be my two theta. So from, you can see that this term here is basically is this length. So sigma xx minus sigma yy is all of this. If I divide by two, I have only this half, right? So it's one part of this, of this, uh, right triangle. So one thing we know is that the radius this radius is equal to this radius in red. It's the same radius because it's the same circle. And we know this radius is going to be equal to this square root that I have here. So what we can do from these equations immediately, we can have, without going to the Mohr circle, we can have the equations to derive the principal stresses, sigma one and sigma two. So sigma one is going to be this one, sigma two is going to be this one, right? So sigma one, so if I start from here, from the origin, I go all the way to the center of my circle, and then I need to continue to advance in the positive direction with a value equal to the radius. Sigma two, I do this way, I go to the center first, then I come back, so minus, the radius and I am back at point two. 
okay? So these are the equations you are familiar with if you replace the center and the radius by this. So you'll get the, the square root. Okay, and for sigma two, the only difference is, oops, is here instead of a plus, you have a minus, minus, right? And then you have this equation here that will give you all the, sorry, will give you a stress so what we are going to do is we are going to apply this equation to this let me copy So what we are going to do is we are going to say on the left hand side instead of sigma I'm going to say I want to look for sigma x prime x prime basically is going to be this one sigma x prime x prime and then I know this is given by this equation and this angle theta I can put in green, so two theta. Okay. Um, and then I can transform the stress sigma x. The stress is in red here. I can transform to sigma x prime x prime. Uh, what if I want sigma y prime y prime? How do I do? Well, you do by using this same equation, but you need now to be careful with the angle you put there because this angle is always about my um, x direction okay so this is my x direction right so for y prime I need to get this angle here right this angle is theta plus 90 degrees you agree with me so the only thing I need to do in this equation is to replace here theta by so here instead of theta I'm going to put theta plus 90 degrees and same thing here okay And then this equation becomes So this equation becomes equal, okay, over two, cosine of two theta, change the color, so cosine uh, two theta plus 
180 is going to be equal to minus cosine of 2 theta, right? So this becomes, oops, instead of a plus here, I will have a minus. And here I will have sine of 2 theta plus 180 is equal to minus sine as well, right? So, okay, just let make sure I'm thinking properly because, okay, if I have here 2 theta, cosine here is positive. This bit is positive, but if I add to this two theta 180 degrees, my cosine is going to be negative. That is correct. What about the sine? Sine of two theta is positive. Sine of two theta plus 180, so this angle is 180, is going to be negative. Yeah, it's correct, isn't it? So here needs to be also minus. Minus sine of 2 theta, okay? And so we can, <coughs> the only equation I need is the, the shear tau x prime, y prime, uh, and that equation is given by minus sigma x, x minus sigma y, y over 2, sine of 2 theta, plus tau x, y, cosine of two theta. Okay, these three equations is the ones you need to know. Uh, they can be written in another form. I'm just going to, to copy the final form of the equations in a different slide. We need to be careful with time. Okay, it's fine. Uh, let me just see if I'm not missing anything. So there's another thing we can do. Oh, okay, by the way, homework is obtain these equations from geometrical considerations of this more circle. If you want to practice, it's not homework, it's just something for you to practice. So if I take into account this trigonometric transformations, like this one, cosine square of theta equal to 1 over 2 plus 1 over 2 cosine of 2 theta. If I take this one, sine square of theta is going to be equal 1 over 2 minus 1 over 2 cosine of 2 theta. These are trigonometric transformations. Sine of 2 theta equal to 2 times the sine of theta cosine of theta and cosine of 2 theta equal to cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta. The reason why I'm doing this, this trigonometric relations allows me to, try to move from an angle 2 theta to an angle of theta only, right? So if I replace this cosine of 2 theta uh, 
sine of 2 theta in these previous equations, which I can copy. Well, I don't need to copy. If I replace them here, what I get is this simplified form for my transformation equations, which I'm going to write here. So, sigma x prime x prime equal to, let me, sigma x x, c square, well, I'm going to say c is cosine of theta, s sine of theta, just to make our life a bit easier. Okay? S square sine of theta square plus two times tau xy cosine of theta times sine of theta. A bit nicer, isn't it? Sigma y prime y prime equal to sigma xx sine square of theta plus sigma y y cosine of square of theta minus two times tau xy cosine of theta sine of theta and the last one for the shear stress you get sigma y y cosine of theta theta sine of theta minus sigma x x cosine of theta sine of theta plus tau x y cosine square minus sine square that's it why am I doing this you might be asking well because this now is in a very convenient form to put this into matrix form I, I mean where I can say on the left hand side I will have my the stress stresses I want to obtain in the prime system and here I will have what? I will have C square S square to CS S square C square minus 2 CS CS minus CS C square minus S square and this will multiply my sigma X sigma Y tau XY stress transformation this matrix we call this matrix well transformation matrix it allows me to transform the stresses from one coordinate system to another coordinate system knowing this angle theta basically between this between x and x prime that's it and then I can transform it from x to x prime or the other way around, right? I just need to invert the matrix. Well, any questions so far? So this was a little bit of review. We need to continue composite analysis next week. We will. Uh, but I think we don't have time to continue for the next thing because it takes a lot of time. Not a lot of time, it takes more time. We don't have enough time today. Any questions here?
All right, so see you guys in one hour in computer lab. You know, you know where it is, right? Tower C, second floor, 208.